Hey, I'm really looking forward to my next talk with Giacomo Zucco. Again, he's, he has a really in-depth uh, knowledge and, you know, uh, profound uh, comprehension, uh, not only, you know, um, about Bitcoin, but um, all the topics that are interconnected with Bitcoin. So in the times of, uh, you know, we've got the year 2020, uh, we have, um, you know, unimaginable cartel or structure architecture of, uh, you know, legally unaccountably, politically untouchable and criminally immune and uh, unaccountable, um, you know, system of central banks, governments, nation states, regimes, you know, the monetary system and everything that is uh, flowing out of this, would it be, you know, laws and, and, uh, you know, actions and enforcements and coercion and aggression and violence, uh, you know, and unjust, unconstitutional, unethical actions that are taken upon, uh, uh, on this foundation, uh, you know, who is suffering at the end of the day, you know, who, uh, how long can we endure this? I mean, we have lost at least a hundred years of uh, not only monetary, economical, financial, but uh, but especially um, social, uh, scientific, technological evolution. We've lost a lot of uh, you know evolutionary potential of of, of technological innovation, of freedom, uh, of prosperity, joy, and pleasure. So it's really let's just boil it down, let's break it down. And this is why I, it's not a philosoph philosophical talk. It's actually a really really practical question. Uh, why, you know, how can we, how can we educate more? How can we be more effective? What are, what is, you know, what is the one and only effective action and, and, um, you know, and understanding and comprehension, uh, and, and, you know, evolutionary process, uh, we can take individually and collectively as totality as human, uh, civilization. So, um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to my talk with Giacomo Zucco. Uh, thanks so much for, for your questions again on Twitter. I'm um, going to discuss this, of course, with him at the end of, the, of, of our talk. But uh, first of all, you know, let's go into, into depth and really understand the question uh, you know, before looking for answers. You know, why Bitcoin? Um, what are the real root causes? of all the problems, the symptoms, the suffering, the pain, the inequalities, the unjust uh, things that are going on, the, un, you know, the unconstitutional, unethical, criminal things that are going on. Why, why are we enduring this? Why, you know, why, how, can we, how can we help? How can we educate more? How can we be more effective? Are we ready for an unexpected uh, rise in demand, for an unexpected you know, critical adoption uh, of humanity um, uh, for Bitcoin. All right, so here we go. Without further ado, my interview with Giacomo Zucco. The one and only original Giacomo Zucco. <laughs> hey, Giacomo, thanks so much for your time again and coming on my show, The Total Bitcoin Show. How are you doing, man? Fine, thank you. My pleasure to be here again. Yeah, listen, so we had a really great talk. Uh, it, it was just uh, amazing. Uh, the last talk we had um, on uh, your, you know, seven part series. Um, uh, what was that like a long title, like a brief overview from the caveman to the lightning network, something like to that, the lightning right? Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discovering yeah. Bitcoin was the overall title because there was a discovery process and it was from, uh, from uh, fishing caveman to the lightning network. Exactly. So I would recommend anyone who hasn't read yet. I mean, I read it at least I think through it two or three times because it was so succinct. Um, here you go. I think there it is. Yeah, Bitcoin Magazine. Yeah. dot com slash author slash Giacomo Anyway, um, so anyone should read that. Uh, uh, anyone who hasn't had a chance, um, Giacomo. So I have um, I have some topics um you know I, I i i you know i wrote you i want to go a little bit deeper um into you know the fundamental uh things that surround the topic of bitcoin and you know i want to talk about this taboo topic uh central banks with you <laughs> sure <laughs> you know sometimes i'm thinking you know the more i think about it I'm, i don't know sometimes should i uh, you know, should I laugh and cry at the same time? Because it's such a, it, it feels like, or it, it, 
you know, it feels like it's, we are living really in a simulation. The more I think about it, it's like, are we living in a simulation? <laughs> what do you think about, you know, this whole uh, structure? I'm, I think that, I mean, uh, the, the point that reality is so absurd right now that I think that's a good argument for the theory that we don't live in a simulation. Usually reality is much more absurd that you can come up with with an artificial narrative or story. Uh, no, no writer, uh, no matter how crazy, can come up with stuff as crazy as reality usually. <laughs> so no, I don't subscribe to that theory. Even if my my favorite movie of all time is the the first original Matrix, so of course uh, I mean Plato Cave uh, myth. So I love that kind of stuff. But uh, I mean, I was I was going around talking about the, the simulation theory when I was 16 and 17 because it was a very nerd thing to do. But now it's too mainstream. Like everybody's going around saying it's a simulation. So I'm, get, I'm getting back to the to the contrary of you. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back down to earth. Um, uh, you know, Giacomo, the, uh, I, I talk to a lot of people, especially you know, in the Bitcoin community and Bitcoin space. Everybody says it's like. Uh, in, you know, maybe in a different wording, but everybody sort of says it's inevitable that we are going at like the sort of a conflict, a war, uh, a resistance uh, by the state, through the state or nation state, regime, government, uh, you know, in parenthesis, central banks is going to be inevitable. So it's not avoidable anymore. So this is why, you know, again, to the question, why Bitcoin? I mean, it, at the end of the day, this is going to lead to a, you know, to a really upfront confrontation with as long as they don't feel threatened. Uh, you know, when you, it's like, you know, the cat that it's, you know, uh, pushed more and more into the corner. So, you know, there's going to be a moment when that cat is going to be, you know, so fearful, so, um, uh, you know, <laughs> panic uh, mode that it's going to strike back it's going to you know do something react so when is uh do you want to go like into this uh issue with me a little bit sure so uh i will not agree with the fact that the the clash the uh, the struggle is uh, inevitable uh, is not evitable anymore uh because it, it it never was actually evitable i mean it's by design what we what we mean when when we say that Bitcoin will inevitably uh, bring to a struggle with the the status quo of the political power, basically, uh, we are talking about the design of Bitcoin itself, the the reason uh, it has been created, and the, the original design of the uh, peer to peer uh, digital uh, bearer instrument uh, cash uh, digital gold narrative. It was designed to go against. Uh, uh, the status quo in at least two ways. The first one is a uh, uh, financial freedom and financial censorship, censorship resistance. So the fact that uh, with cash, with physical cash or physical gold, I can uh, pay whoever I want without uh, having any idea of who I'm paying and without him especially having any idea of who is paying him. Uh, so the, the, the whole thing, I like to say, I, I think I tweeted that out a few weeks ago or a few months ago, the whole notion of KYC, know your customer, is a completely uh, ignorant, economically ignorant notion because the real point about money is that uh, the customer, uh, he, he will still need to know a little bit and to trust the merchant because otherwise the, the, uh, the, the products that you buy or the services that you buy uh, they could be not good or they could never be delivered. So uh, the customer needs to trust and to know the merchant a little bit. That's why you have usually several customers for one single merchant, but the merchant doesn't have to know the customer. If the merchant knew every single customer and trusted any single customer, then the merchant would not need money at all. He could just exchange favors and, and barter products and favors or credit the reason that the money is so functional to expand the merch uh, to expand the market and to expand the exchange is that uh, the money makes uh, uh, not necessary the, uh, the trust in the customer and knowledge of the customer so that's absolutely natural with face-to-face uh, -face physical cash but it's completely uh, impossible to replicate with, with the uh, with basically centralized uh, uh, e-commerce uh, e-payment solutions because uh, uh, the, the way money evolved uh, historically and politically 
was basically as an instrument to control and censor and manipulate and, and, and cage and tax and mint the economy by the state. So there is this transaction freedom part and transaction privacy part. And the second part, of course, is more substantial. It's something that even physical cash cannot protect you from, but all the physical gold can protect you from, which is the manipulation of the, of the monetary base uh, directly, of the mon monetary supply uh, and especially uh, the monetary base. So uh, gold, uh, you, which you cannot inflate uh, at will, uh, versus uh, uh, versus uh, fiat money that uh, uh, which supply is completely arbitrary. So Bitcoin is designed to go against the status quo. The reason that uh, we are not necessarily seeing any clear, obvious, catastrophic struggle anytime soon, or maybe in some very very uh, niche scenario, maybe not even ever. Uh, but I don't think that's that's very likely. Is that uh, this is a social dynamics. Uh, and social dynamics usually they have uh, this kind of uh, um, this kind of uh, you know second degree effects. It's like a three D chess. So the fact that, that uh, you know it's like the atomic bomb. So the atomic bomb inevitably destroys uh, whole cities and countries. But if you have it and I have it now, you can dest destroy my city. But you will probably not because you know that if you do, I can. Uh, likely destroy yours, so we have this kind of uh, uh, reassured mutual destruction, which actually can create a disincentive to attack. So uh, the fact that something can do something uh, may even prevent the attempt itself. So there is this kind of strange negative feedback that can keep an equilibrium for many many years in a in a, but it's not a peaceful equilibrium. This, it is a, a tension right. equilibrium. Yeah. It is like a, it's like a, a a growing uh, cold war between Bitcoin and, and central banks. So, uh, yes, yeah, central banks will, I mean, central banks need to attack Bitcoin and they will need to attack Bitcoin harder and harder and heavier when Bitcoin will become bigger and, and, and more powerful. But if they do and if they fail, they waste money making Bitcoin stronger. So there is this kind of anti-fragility of the Bitcoin system, which makes maybe a little less uh, uh, obvious uh, at least the timing of the attack, uh, and the second, the second reason, because uh, the second reason for uh, for the uncertainty about the timing and the entity of this struggle is that there is not the government. What we have no right now is mostly a cartel of uh, of a few uh, a few hundred, I mean hundreds, uh, a few decades, let's say, of big governments. It's it's like a cartel and uh, uh, like a mafia cartel in Mexico. It's not one family and you are against this family. You are against the cartel and the cartel is internally composed of different interests that are sometimes uh, in conflict with each other. So uh, we could have, uh, for, a, for, a, for some time, we could have a single nation state with its central bank actually embracing Bitcoin as a weapon against another central state with a more powerful central bank. So the, fracture, the internal, internal composition of the Bitcoin's natural enemy, which is the government and the central bank, uh, actually makes uh, possible that there will be some kind of internal internal nuances to that. Uh, but overall, yeah, uh, it's basically, uh, I would say, Bitcoin is by design uh, disruption of the central banking system and of the financial surveillance system. So there is no peace possible there. Uh, but uh, the, the way in which the war will develop is not obvious, it's not straightforward. We don't have to expect, uh, uh, I mean, Eric Bosquil, we were talking about him before, he theorized a very, very clear cut phase mechanism in which you have the honeymoon phase in which uh, uh, the, the state is okay because Bitcoin is legal and nobody cares. So there is just this mis misconception about what Bitcoin is and you can maybe try to pretend to accept it. Then there is like the, the real struggle black market phase in which actually you rule Bitcoin uh, illegal, you outlaw Bitcoin everywhere. And then there is the competition phase in which the government says, okay, I cannot really stop Bitcoin because it's designed not to be stopped, but I can try to make it hard to, to work. I can try to double spend it, censor transaction, uh, take control of hashing power, so I can spend money in order to attack it. And uh, what, I, what I think about this theory is that Logically, this is the correct theory. This, this is actually the, the first degree 
um, social dynamic that is in place. But since it is a social dynamics, uh, and since it's a very composite social dynamic with different actors, maybe this is not really literally how it will play out. Maybe we will have different cycles. Maybe there will be a honeymoon and then a struggle, black market phase, then another honeymoon in another part of the world, then some other part of the world will get back to the honeymoon phase, and then again to the acceptance. Uh, this is similar to the, I think that Antonopoulos was the first to make a comparison between uh, acceptance of Bitcoin and the five uh, uh, stages, stages of elaboration of, of right. loss of Kubler Ross, right? So even these stages, they are pretty good at descri as a description. So you have uh, you have uh, denial, Bitcoin doesn't exist. Rage, Bitcoin will be stopped because they are criminals. Um, uh, bargain, Bitcoin, ne, but blockchain, yes, and government cryptocurrency, that's the, that's the way to go. And, and we are mostly at the end of this phase. Then there is the depression. Okay, this blockchain stuff was just a scam and cryptocurrency uh, bubble was just a bubble uh, and nothing is, nothing is interesting here. And then acceptance. Of course, this is a good model, but probably we will just have not a clear uh, circle, but actually a continuous, uh, in, continuous uh, instances of these cycles in different places with different uh, timings and with different delays. Okay. So, oh, wonderful. So, um, so it seems to me that we are jumping sort of in between these five stages sometimes. Uh, I don't know. It makes the impression to me that, you know, uh, uh, there's different segments, uh, like a dynamic interplay of all these groupings and, and mindsets um, discussing with one another. Well, let me, let me ask you this. So at the end of the day, because we're hearing, um, you know, black market money, I think a lot of people associate black market with criminality, you know, or, or anything that is nefarious, but actually Bitcoin is the ultimate black market money for billions or the total humanity, isn't it? It is. The point is that the total majority of, uh, of markets in the world today and in human history was actually black market. What black market means is market which is not explicitly sanctioned by one single political group, uh, which is basically the, 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 almost the totality of the economic interaction in the history of mankind. Because the point of exchanges and economies is that uh, you cannot wait for a single central planner to, uh, author, to, pre to preemptively authorize you to exchange based on his uh, uh, peculiar interest and, uh, or, uh, or morality or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or whatever. So uh, the, the point of the market is that uh, is a decentralized process in which everybody tries to maximize utility exchanging with everybody else. And you don't have a single, uh, single uh, mafia boss that can say you can exchange with him only that quantity with that price. Uh, so even in places like uh, the Soviet Union, when in theory you have a completely centrally planned economy, that's, that's a theory, but that's not a reality. What you have in the, in the reality of the Soviet Union is a huge uh, black market. And the more the white uh, legally, uh, legally um, allowed for market is strict and, uh, and planned and, uh, and static, the more the, 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 the economy will just move to the, to the black market. Of course, we tend to have this kind of bias in which, uh, I mean, the, the, even the terminology itself seems to be uh, developed by people that uh, tend to think uh, of the, what we call the normal market, the healthy, normal, decentralized market, which is the black market, uh, as something black, those uh, dark, those uh, scary, dangerous, evil, or uh, immoral or whatever. While the white market is, is this like angelic uh, um, uh, virtuous thing. But, but I, the, 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 probably the neutral uh, proper terminology would be a uh, normal market, which is just people exchanging and uh, let's, let's say planned uh, restricted market uh, or, or even more, 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 even more accurately violent market in which uh, uh, some economic transactions are violently uh, banned or violently persecuted by one, uh, uh, one specific uh, violent organization like uh, a mafia or a government or a, uh, a terrorist group or, or, or whatever. So if you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, ISIS or, uh, or Cosa Nostra in, Sic in Sicilia or uh, uh, the Italian Rep Republic or North Korea or uh, a single group that, uh, that actually 
authorize a single set of transaction and use violence to rule out everything else, that's what we call white market, but it's actually a restricted, a violently restricted market. While black market is, is actually everything else. So it's just the market. So uh, when you say criminality, um, the, of course, you know, every, every time we have to discuss and educate and, uh, and do the stuff that we do and, uh, and analyze and research, we need to do some terminological choice, choices. And they're not easy because, for example, one choice would be to just uh, rebut and reject this kind of terminology because uh, it has a negative connotation. So, yeah. now this is, so Bitcoin is not for black market. Uh, it's for a normal market. So you reject the label. The other, the other possibility is ju you just accept it and you, and you, and you basically uh, put it upside down. You, you, you embrace it and you just, uh, and you just uh, uh, overthrow the, the narrative. Uh, right. under Can I because, inject? Can I inject yeah, sure, an sure. addendum? addendum. No, that's really important what you're saying because so that means um, uh, it's a medium of exchange. So, so it should be for for any kind of free exchange as long as nobody is harming nobody else. Like for example, whatever cannabis, you know, like we could say this is criminal, but why should it be? Yeah, it's a terminology problem. So why is it criminal? Just because somebody says that the government, the the whatever the the uh, uh, the, the the you know corrupted uh, judicial legislative system. I mean, who says that? You know, so I think we need to go away. Yeah, you're totally right. We need to really distance ourselves from this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a dyna dynamic choice, right? It's a strategy choice or even a tactical choice. Sometimes a few years ago, I was I was always like, no, no, Bitcoin is not. I mean, you don't get the point. Bitcoin is not really for criminals. Nowadays, I usually answer when some, some somebody says that yes. Bitcoin is exactly for criminal. It is especially for criminals and we are all criminals because if you think about that, every single action that we do uh, since we, we wake up in the morning until late nine, it is criminal, uh, it is literally illegal in some places of the world. For example, if you are a woman and you're driving, that's criminal somewhere. If you are, if Sorry, you are a man, you are reading, yeah. if you're reading a Bible, that's criminal somewhere. If you are, if you are, or if it's not criminal somewhere in the world, it was for sure criminal sometime in some part of the world. So if you are homosexual or if you are, if you are just whatever, if you're drinking wine, whatever you're doing was or is illegal somewhere for some specific political power. That's a completely arbitrary distinction. Hiding Jews during the Holocaust was illegal. Freeing slaves during slavery uh, was illegal. Um, um, heroic moral actions were illegal, neutral normal action were illegal, and also bad, uh, actually, uh, seriously, ethically criminal action are sometimes illegal and sometimes they are not. So that's a completely wrong kind of, uh, if with criminal we, need, we mean illegal, everything is literally illegal somewhere and sometimes. Of course, there is another, things, another thing to be said about uh, Bitcoin and criminality, uh, is, it would be a little bit unfair, a little bit dishonest to, to just stop saying that uh, Bitcoin is for criminals and every action is criminal. Because the real point is that Bitcoin is a tool and so even, nefar even actually nefarious actions that me and you will agree, they're not just illegal, they're actually really evil by, right. by logical uh, definition of, uh, of uh, human rights and property. So from a Jewish naturalist point of view, they would be evil action, for example, killing people or stuff like that. Uh, well, Bitcoin as a tool will also help people. It will not do anything evil, but it will help people by uh, doing anything evil uh, continuously. Uh, but it's the same as oxygens. I mean, how do, you, uh, how do you rob a bank without breathing oxygen? How do you... Uh, how do you beat your wife without uh, without having hands? How do you how do you do any kind of uh, uh, ransomware uh, uh, computer crime without having a keyboard? Uh, I mean, cars, shoes. Uh, if if uh, if criminals in the in the moral sense and not just I mean in the legal sense we are all criminals by some definition and in the moral sense if very very nasty criminals will not use shoes, I will actually think there is something wrong with uh, the way shoes are conceived and, and done. 
So it's good for shoes that even criminals can use them because otherwise they will just be suspicious as a tool. Exactly. And, and, and you know, the difference is, uh, because let me, because this is important, um, I, I wanted to take sort of a short excursion because I wrote a, you know, a series of articles um, uh, about the, you know, the central bank structure beginning with the Bank for International Settlements. So they have literally criminal immunity. They are politically untouchable, legally unaccountable, and criminally immune. So it means uh, they, it, nothing can be enforced or they cannot be punished, they cannot be seized, they cannot be any, anything. So all the members, so this is, this is the, why I asked you in the beginning, is this really, is this real? Is, or is this like a simula simulated reality? This cannot be. How can a foundation architecture of such a structure be so criminal and have a profound fundamental effect and consequential damages on on the whole population, on the whole you know humanity, and get away with this. And the yeah. So when we were discussing the real, I mean the fact that criminal is a very arbitrary concept, uh, I, I didn't I didn't mean that we should embrace just complete moral relativism, like uh, everything is criminal, everything is not. There are some things that are objectively, rationally, uh, not right. And usually you, you get a very, it's not, a, it's not subjective, it's not relative. There is a very, very strict logical way of distinguishing things that are fair from things that are unfair. Usually what you, what you find is, uh, uh, is um, universalism versus uh, uh, legal privileges. So when you have uh, somebody that says that everybody should do something except for me, uh, that's a very clear red flag that something is wrong about the structure. So you, th you think about that, like the, if you think about uh, you shall not kill uh, or you shall not murder, which is more accurate. That's a very, that's a very precise and very consistent statement logically. Uh, you shall not kill, mur murder, so I will not murder you, you will not murder me, and that's okay. Well, if, but if you think about, about that, you shall pay your taxes, is very very different because what that means is is you should not come to my house with your guns to ask for my money but i should instead come to your house asking your money otherwise threatening you of violence so th there is always this the, the point of statism of uh, this religion of the modern state which is not really something very ancient is is very recent is uh, it, it, it developed in the last centuries and is be, has become is is getting mainstream in the last decades actually uh, it was probably the peak of statism was the the middle of uh, of the 20th century so we have just passed from a few decades the the very high point the the, the whole time height of statist f fanatism uh, fanaticism but uh, what statist fanaticism is is privilege uh, some people can do things that would be immoral if done by somebody somebody else so uh, if you print money in your basement, you are a criminal forger. Uh, if I print money in my central bank, I am just saving the economy and I'm, 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 I'm just doing, I, I'm, I'm just practicing monetary policies. And uh, if you go to your neighbor and you point a gun and you take his money, that's extortion. But if we, when we do that, and uh, if you don't open the door, maybe we shot your dog and then we shot you and then we take your children. Or that maybe like in WAC in the US, we will just kill everybody, including women and children. So that's just the, that's just a price for civilization. So central banks are, are a legal cartel. Uh, it's not that the action they do, it's intrinsically wrong. Uh, creating, uh, creating debt, uh, change, I mean, offering a monetary, uh, I, I mean, for example, we discuss scam coins and shit coins a lot. And often we say that uh, uh, shit coins are stupid because the monetary policy is intrinsically uh, inflationistic because you can create uh, as many shit coins as you want. And even within the single shit coin, like in Ethereum, they can just create money at will. This is stupid. So if you, if you invest in that long term, you will get wrecked. But it's not strictly uh, immoral from it's not criminal, it's not aggression, because uh, uh, you do something stupid and stupid people will, will, will buy into that and they will suffer because of that, which is consequence of responsibility. While central banks are different, they are printing money 
and they are leveraging leveraging uh, legal tender laws. That means that you are uh, violently forbidden from refusing to take that money as a payment. So it's 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 a crime, and you get in jail if you refuse to get paid with that kind of money. Yeah. So they are they are they are creating this kind of legal privilege, which is I mean the history is full of that. If you think about the American Revolution, it started against the, the the first part of the revolution, the Boston Tea Party was not literally against the 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 United United Kingdom uh, Crown. It was yeah. actually again the East the, 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 the India uh, the, the India Company the Indian Trade Company. It was a private company in theory, but it had a legal privilege to do something that everybody else was from be forbidden from doing. So you have the economy, you have the property rights, and then somebody is uh, uh, entitled with uh, uh, more artificial violent rights, which are different from the natural uh, homesteading or contract uh, rights of all the other people. So uh, central banks are basically this. And when you say they are a legalized money launder facility, that's true. I mean, uh, the, the way the KYC and AML uh, laws work is that if you get paid by me, you have to prove who I am, where did I get the money from. But if you are paid uh, passing through this kind of international uh, cartel of banks, then they have the legal right to transform something which is dirty, of course, we, yeah, we, we really got to think about this. I mean, for a moment, just for stand still for a moment and and think this is a criminal immunity. They have a privilege of whitewashing, money laundering. Uh, there's every crime you can think of, and it's and they've and they've gotten away with that. I mean, uh, 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 factually, white, you know, black and white. There's this whole procedure, you know, with uh, Tim Geithner and all these people who have like different hats on, you know, in different positions. And uh, it, there's, you know, great documentaries and, and investigative reports about this. So uh, I think, you know, uh, really comparing it and, and, and uh, seeing the reality as it is, uh, I think would help people understand the question first of all, why Bitcoin, and then thinking about the decision they're going to do and then commit, you know, going into action. And this is, you know, also the purpose of this whole educational podcast is to really understand it on a comprehension level that usually are not really uh, um, talked about because it's either, you know, circumvented or, you know, we can't do anything about it. But I think, don't you think it's, this is the root cause? The more we understand the root cause, the more people would go into action? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that the more people understand the root cause, the, the more people will either will go into action or will go into action effectively. Because a, a lot of people, especially now, a lot of people in rich countries, maybe people who are not struggling for for the uh, for the base level levels of, of uh, survival anybody else is going into action somehow i mean a lot of young people uh, they are doing like occupy wall street uh, or yeah. trying to vote harder this politician yeah. or the other politician or they will do maybe i mean uh, even people in good faith like protesting in iran uh, they protest against uh, maybe some uh, theocracy uh, and in Hong Kong, they protest uh, China, but then in, uh, in maybe in Venezuela, they protest socialism, the, which impoverished Venezuela. But then in Chile, they protest the fact that they don't have enough socialism and the same goes in the US. So everybody's protesting something and there's a lot of, uh, and there is lo a lot of uh, will to do something, but uh, missing the fundamental connection, mi missing the fundamental uh, logical uh, consistency of the picture. The problem is that maybe you do act, but you don't act effectively. You don't act in a way that makes sense. You just act based on uh, um, momentary uh, emotions. You just you just follow feelings and not really uh, facts and, and logical rules. Uh, and, and one one uh, one litmus test for that is actually just logical consistencies versus double standards. So what you said before, I mean, you look at, at, I mean, there are these Canadian banks, they actually launder money from the most violent Mexican uh, drug cartels ever. And then there is one guy uh, that creates a, a peaceful website for trading uh, recreational drugs and other stuff, the Silk Road. I mean, people, people doesn't know, but people don't know, but the most, uh, the most sold 
items on the Silk Road were actually books. So number one items sold on the Silk Road were books. And, uh, and then like third, there was like, uh, uh, like marijuana, which is by the way, legal now in many US states. So the guy who created, the, the young boy who created that website in order to have a peaceful and as honest as possible trade among uh, consenting adults, he is, ju is just you know, now kidnapped and kept in a jail for the, they want to keep him in, in uh, they, they sent, sentenced him, Ross Woolbrick, to two live sentences without parole for creating a website, creating and managing a website. Right. While, uh, while a bank manager actually laundering money for uh, the uh, real violent drug cartels in Mexico, they are just, I mean, they're okay. Maybe they will, they will pay a fine, but then they will get a bonus and they will just pay the fine with the bonus and it's okay. Okay, great. Um, you know, we hear often uh, as, as soon, like for everything, there's a time. So uh, we often hear in our, in our discussions or in, with other people when I have discussions like, okay, when the time comes and the people are in need, when they have the need for that, they go into action, you know, they're going to adopt it. Uh, they're going to start using Bitcoin, you know, uh, start educating themselves about Bitcoin. But, you know, I always say, you know, could have people known that Elon Musk, you know, could have whatever, create, uh, built that uh, a Tesla car. People didn't know that they, they would have, you know, needed that car now. So we can create, I guess, you know, I, I believe in the power of creating that, that need if we make it more easy. So maybe we can go a little bit into the more practical questions. Um, if we had the the realistic, I mean, well, let's just say theoretically, if we had the opportunity right now, um, or if you could, you know, create those structures, the technological platforms, you know, the the, the by default functions, features, mobile wallet, full node, everything else, and we would have fully built out the infrastructure of Lightning Network, everything that needs to be, you know, as a medium of exchange, as a payment system, easy, cheesy, fungible, divisible, portable, you know, uh, privacy, full, uh, full privacy, would that accelerate the, the process of critical adoption rate? Well, this is, I mean, this is a little bit a rhetorical question. Of course, if you, if you have um, more value in your tool, more people will find utility and they will, uh, they will discover utility faster because the, the tool is just better or better, better marketed, better, better presented, better documented, better sold. So that, that's, that's of course true. Let's say that there, there are two, there are these two extremes, right? On one extreme, you have the, uh, the, you, you have the awareness that uh, the market is a very complex process and you by yourself, you cannot centrally plan the market. That's why politicians and bureaucrats, they fail when they try to plan the economy because the economy is a, is a decentralized, sparse uh, process and you cannot plan it. So there is like this humility. I cannot really do something. It will happen when it will happen. It, it has to be organic. On the other side, you have like the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, spirit of, I have a, I have a vision, uh, I want to create my proposal, I have a vision, I have a plan. Uh, and this is, uh, it's not that the first one is good and the second is bad. They are both good if used in the, in the right way. What I mean is that if, uh, I mean, let's imagine that Satoshi Nakamoto was just going to, to it was getting closer to the, to the solution of the time chain for double spending. And then it was going to, to develop and then it says, well, actually the market will just figure it out. When people really need this stuff, uh, a spontaneous order will create this stuff. I mean, the market will figure out. The problem with the sentence, the market will figure out is that you are part of the market. You are not the whole market. That's why you cannot really control and plan the market, but you are part of the market. So you do have to act. Because if everybody thinks that everybody else will do something, nobody will do anything. So uh, we, we cannot just always be uh, neutral and never propose, never plan, never design, never suggest, never criticize, never build, uh, never challenge, never test. We have to do all this stuff. But we don't have to think that when we do this kind of stuff, we will automatically be able to uh, change 
um, substantial uh, long-term dynamic. I would say that the difference is basically um, the more something is short-term and, uh, and high level in the social stack, like a single service, a single product, the more you have to act with your vision. And the more you're talking about long-term global, uh, global protocols, like uh, the languages, uh, communication platforms, uh, standards, this kind of stuff, you cannot really plan it. You can just propose it, and then after a while, it will change. So in the, in the age of Satoshi, in the days of Satoshi, when there is no Bitcoin, you have to be a central, central not a violent uh, state planner, but you have to be a free market central planner because you have to launch uh, something, you have to do something. Like you said, Elon Musk, but the same for Satoshi. You have to do something and you have to choose. You have to choose uh, how many minutes, like 10 minutes for, uh, for block uh, rate or 20 or five, you have to choose. Uh, how many megabytes? One megabytes, two megabytes, 10 gigamax. You have to choose, you have to make choices. But when the, 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 the protocol spreads and it gets adopted, then you cannot really choose anymore. And at a certain point, you have to start to adapt, uh, your, uh, to adapt your expectation and your strategy to the external reality that you cannot change anymore. So I would say that right now, um, if you, uh, I mean, you cannot say uh, people is not using, bit, using Bitcoin, so let's change fundamental properties of, of Bitcoin in order to better serve these people. That's, uh, that's, that's using this kind, sorry, I, I was using the other hand. This kind of approach for this kind of problem. The global adoption of Bitcoin is a spontaneous, long-term, uh, huge scale phenomenon that you cannot plan for. It will happen when it will happen. What you can plan for is your single role inside Bitcoin, your service, your education platform, uh, your, your uh, pull request on the code, your wallet, your, uh, your exchange, your liquidity provider service, your lightning channel, um, uh, of course, um, the, the, uh, being the, the hero which creates the standard that lasts for centuries is psychologically more appealing than being the guy that creates the wallet uh, that lasts uh, five years. I understand that. But the, the, the lesson of reality is that you have to be humble and you have to understand what is your role there. Uh, you, you mentioned, for example, Elon Musk. Some people often mention uh, Steve Jobs as an example of somebody who created uh, user needs on a very huge scale. But compared to what we want to do in Bitcoin, uh, I mean, I, I really I respect the, 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 uh, the, the legend, the personal legend of Steve Jobs, the, also the, the, design, uh, the design history of Apple. But the point is that the, the incredible stuff, the shocking world scale stuff that Steve Jobs has done is literally peanuts in comparison to what we are discussing here about changing the, uh, the monetary base of the world economy in a sustainable intergenerational way. I mean, what you can, you, you can have a good marketing team that can create a need in a vast user base, but this will just be a fad. This will just be a moment. You cannot really artificially push for something that resists long term. If, you, if there is a trend and you go against the trend, you can go against the trend for a while, but, then, but this is, it is an unstable equilibrium because you are not following the natural um, uh, organic uh, 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 minimum energy paths, but you are actually forcing something against the, uh, the, 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 the minimum path, the minimum, minimum action paths. You are doing something not spontaneous, but artificial, which is okay, but is especially good for short-term uh, uh, um, small sector projects uh, where you do have to act. So yeah, so my suggestion would be uh, if you have a if you have a very specific problem which is high level. So like uh, uh, let's think about the social stack, right? You have uh, the, the usual example. I, I do this example every time I know, but I think it's important. So you have the internet is a PAP, then you had you have a HTTP, then you then you have a, a Facebook, and then you have the Facebook app you do have to launch your own Facebook app. And when you are here, you have to be an aggressive central planner because you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to try to, uh, um, like Peter Thiel says, uh, a very interesting, a very interesting uh, phrase. Uh, it's not true that entrepreneurs, they want 
perfect competition and they hate monopolies. They, they want to create a market monopoly. When you become an entrepreneur, you want to create something that nobody else can offer to the market as, as, as you. Maybe they can offer something similar, a substitute good, but not that. What you, you are a monopolist in what you do if you do it well. But, but here in the, in the layer of uh, uh, applications and services, you want to create something, uh, uh, creating user needs or creating new memes and new, uh, new cultures. But in the base layer, when you talk about standards infrastructures, then you have to just face reality and you have to adapt your expectations to reality. So in, in this second level, I will actually um, understand who says uh, we cannot force this and when people will, uh, I mean, uh, uh, people will learn through suffering basically. Okay. And uh, it would be good to save them some suffering and maybe in some, in some degree we can, but uh, the, uh, we, we cannot change the fundamental uh, equilibrium of incentives. Okay. No, I got you. Um, it's just that, um, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I have no other uh, example, but I'm thinking of this interview in 1999 where Jeff Bezos said, you know, uh, where people didn't really understand the journalist who was asking, like, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing this? And he said, hey, I'm, I'm satisfying really the, the real needs of the customer out there. You know, and people just didn't understand what he's literally doing. So I guess when the focus is on the r real satisfaction, uh, uh, the fulfillment of the needs of the of the real or potential client or customer out there, then you know, as an entrepreneur, you are much much more exponentially successful. But going back, you know, to Bitcoin, I'm just saying, I was thinking, you know, of this of this of these phases that are uh, sort of accompanying. Uh, this whole process of adoption of, uh, of potential crypt critical adoption rate of Bitcoin, like for example, Iran during the crisis of Iran just recently, the price of Bitcoin you know went up to twenty four twenty nine thousand uh, dollars per Bitcoin, and people were obviously ready to <laughs> uh, willing to to pay a uh, to pay a premium. So so I'm just I'm just thinking I'm concerned that if these parameters these conditions come at a unexpectedly and too fast. Are those infrastructures already there? Because everybody's saying, you know, you know, deal with it, educate yourself, get yourself a full node. I mean, it's not easy. That's all I'm saying. So, uh, what if there are, you know, potentially really m m so many people out there who do want to have a full node, who do want to have it, who, who do want to have, you know, be capable to handle a, a, a hardware wallet or a mobile wallet or, you know, the technical uh, intricacies. Are we ready then by then unexpectedly? This is what I'm asking, you know? Yeah, and probably the answer is, is no. Probably yeah. if, uh, I mean, probably not in a fatal way. I mean, uh, if, uh, if any major uh, planetary uh, economical meltdown happens tomorrow, uh, I think that eventually Bitcoin can be fixed in time in order to accommodate uh, uh, an alternative, but it will take a lot of time, a lot of suffering and a lot of mistakes, a lot of waste. Uh, of course, the infrastructure is not even remotely ready for something of that proportion. That's why, that's why I mean, uh, on one side, Bitcoiners, they should feel like a really uh, pro-collapse. Like, uh, I, I, understand that the, the, I understand that the status quo is unsustainable. I, I have an alternative, which I know, which I own, and which I study, which I promote. So I look forward to see the status quo collapse in order to get to alternative. But the reason that we are not really like that, and we don't really wish for the for the for a uh, soon collapse, is that uh, you're right. The infrastructure is is absolutely not ready for that yet. Of course, uh, a simple answer. Uh, of course, we have to work in order to make it easier. But uh, but this is a this is a simple goal but it's not a simple strategy because the goal is very clear and very simple, but the way to get there is super complex because the point is that it's very, uh, let's talk about full node. Full node running is crucial because if all the world, uh, if, if a great part of the world economy moves to Bitcoin, but nobody runs validating nodes, then we basically have a trusted system, which is very, very easy to manipulate or censor. You just uh, take over the, I mean, 
in, in the Bitcoin design, if you take over Ashen Power, you cannot control the protocol. You can only censor, temporarily censor transaction, what Eric Wolskill was describing as the, the competition phase. So you have the majority of, of uh, Ashen Power, that's bad, but it's not so bad. You can censor some transactions until the black market will just over, uh, uh, overrun you with higher fees. And you can double spend until the counterpart will just require more confirmations for, or they will just use lightning with more confirmation. So the market will adapt to this kind of attack. While if people is not running validating nodes, then they, they, and for example, they are just trusting the minor majority to decide which block is valid, like they do in uh, altcoins, for example, um, uh, where nobody uh, runs a node. In that case, you, you control the majority, you control everything, which is very, very bad. So we have the problem that we need the majority of people the economical majority of people, of course, is not a matter of how many nodes, but how much money uh, is accepted through that kind of validated node, uh, running a full node. So what do we do? Uh, on one extreme, we have the perfect node setup, which is uh, over Tor, compiled deterministically from source, which is something that uh, it's unrealistic to think people will, will be ever able to do. The majority of people will never be able to, comp to read the, the, the open source uh, uh, code, uh, 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 go through all the code and compile from source directly on a clean uh, Linux machine, um, maybe I'll get, I mean, you, you cannot really do something safe in a generalized way. The other extreme is we just give everybody a trusted, a trusted box with a full node, which is, a, I mean, every full node is just built by, by you and you just give them away and you're the new Steve Jobs and everybody in the world will now have your full node. Uh, this is not ideal either, because now you are the centralized point of control, which is super easy to, to target and to compromise and to uh, blackmail or, or buy off or, or, or anything like that. So uh, we have to, to go in between. It's like, um, in, a way, uh, uh, in a way, developers, they will have to learn from, from non-specialized -spec user how to go more and more uh, simple and clear and collapse some, uh, I mean, maybe users, they don't want so many choices. They want uh, fewer choices. We are more clear and you have to reduce the degrees of freedom. You have to reduce the, the stuff. You have to automatize some processes. You have to give up some kind of idiosyncratic things like common line. I mean, I know that, I mean, doing something on common line is very safe because the surface of uh, surface of attack and of mistake is very reduced. While graphical interfaces are bad for security, but uh, a, a gen generation of people that that was born on a cell phone, uh, they will never go back. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I understand the nerd dream of having right now when I teach courses on Bitcoin, I teach people to do common line stuff because right now we don't have alternative. But I realize that it's unrealistic to think that everybody will do common line stuff. Yeah. On the other hand, though, we, we, we do have to expect that users, it's not like in a you know, Silicon Valley startup will say, the users, they are the king, we have to make users happy, and we have to adapt. In Bitcoin, that's not the same thing. I mean, we have to expect that users will have to adapt to Bitcoin way and way more. Because, uh, of course, the lazy, easy thing is just not to verify anything at all. But we need people to verify. We need people not to trust. We need people to be uh, re resilient or anti-fragile if the service, the centralized service goes down. So we cannot really uh, run, uh, we cannot really over-satisfy or to try to over-please the user uh, degrading the security, but we cannot expect a, a level of security so high that nobody will actually follow that. So it's a very, it's a very subtle equilibrium when we did the um, uh, last May there was uh, uh, Understanding Bitcoin conference in Malta, and uh, and there will be another one at the end of May this year uh, again in Malta. Uh, and uh, there, what we witnessed uh, too was a very delicate equilibrium in which basically you have the people in the audience, maybe not even used to come online, trying very hard to learn, and the developers trying very hard to unlearn what they know and to try to to, to, to get in the, in the shoes of, uh, of the people in the, in, the, in the audience and try to, to facilitate. So I think we will have a continuous 
uh, two-way back and forth uh, feedback between uh, builders and, and users. Uh, but uh, the, some builders, they have the unexpected, um, they have the, the, they have the unrealistic expectation that uh, everybody will just learn uh, command lines, <laughs> command lines, and and some some users or even worse, some uh, user friendly marketing guys uh, from the startup culture, they will just they just have the opposite excess excess of uh, optimism about uh, builders. Like uh, you know, my users, they just want a single click. So you do have to do verification of everything uh, with a single click, which is not the point. Uh, I think a good example is uh, driving a car, especially in Europe, where there is like uh, there is not the automatic, uh, uh, you know, the automatic uh, uh, the, the, the leverage for to, to changing the, mm -hmm. the chain is, is kind of complex. You take some time to learn that it's complex and it's not something that uh, uh, somebody is expected. I mean, it's not easy, but everybody who wants to go around, they eventually have to learn it. And if you think about people in the in the 19th century with uh, with uh, horses and the carriages, the expectation that everybody will learn this strange thing with uh, with uh, explosive stuff put inside the box and then they explode and they move a wheel with electricity. I mean, it's crazy. But what happens that the whole world learned to do that. But even more like writing and reading, uh, uh, writing and reading always was a super technical, difficult and natural. Mm -hmm. Uh, elite uh, secret for for millenniums yep. and for centuries uh, in the in the recent in the last millennium, right. and then uh, a few decades ago, everybody kind of uh, lear started learning to read and write everywhere. Uh, it was a giant effort, but it was a, a necessity. So um, uh, I, I would say, if there is no other way, it's not really unthinkable that grandmas will learn comma lie because. Grandmas learn to read in order to sign uh, banking documents, insurances. Uh, so people can learn incredible stuff if they really need it. Right. Transition is the key. And um, that's what I'm concerned about. How can we make this transition if it is especially unexpected, you know, events or, you know, crash in Europe, you know, meltdowns. I mean, there's just too much going on right now, which is un right now unforeseeable, you know, so we cannot make prediction. I'm just saying, uh, how can we, you know, help or, or, you know, support people, educate themselves, preparing themselves and, um, you know, um, getting them ready for, for this, for this transition phase. Um, let me ask you, uh, uh, you know, for, um, cause I don't, we both have don't much, much time, um, privacy fungibility in connection with KYC, um, and tainting coins. Uh, you know, sure. there's been a lot of discussions going on. And to be, I mean, do we agree that KYC on exchanges is for me totally risky, dangerous, and irresponsible? I mean, if these data, I'm not talking about, about the government or whatever regulatory, just, I'm talking about like, what if these data, where it's like, you, these people, I mean, the exchanges know everything about you, right? They know your name, your address, your passport, your everything, you know, where you, where you live. So if these data ever get leaked to, you know, a bunch of, you know, uh, extortionists or, or criminals, uh, this is, uh, this is pretty, you know, uh, 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 scary thing to think about. Absolutely. I mean, uh, there is just a, a global scale collective denial about this, but if you, uh, I mean, uh, Let's think about how the people freak, freak out about privacy on Facebook. But what we're talking about on Facebook, on Facebook we're talking about public data that we want to share with somebody. And we are scared that people will aggregate and sell this data to uh, third parties that will conduct some kind of analytics with the ultimate goal to sell us some kind of advertising which is closer to our preferences, which, okay, it may be invasive and annoying, but actually, I mean, the worst case scenario, they're just selling you the stuff you want. So uh, the, the, the point here is that we, we overreact to this level, but now j just move from this level to some level up. So, yeah, uh, so a central party having your data is bad because it's dangerous, because it can be uh, sold or, st or stolen or lost or leaked or whatever. Then on top of that, 
there is this particular subset of services which are the financial services which is even worse because in that case as you said i mean if you know the final if you know how much a guy is paying that is more sensitive that uh, what the guy is just saying i mean talk is cheap so maybe maybe the guy says uh, i love gold but if you know that he is actually buying gold you know that he has some money so if you are an extortionist or a stalker or a compete or a or a uh, or an aggressive competitor or a government or uh, or any other kind of of uh, of attacker then the financial information are most critical uh, they, are, they are very very delicate as information then you have financial information on top of a layer which has a high degree of uh, internal connection after you uh, then minimize the first uh, the first node, which is basically the Bitcoin time chain. So when you transact on chain, uh, everybody is kind of protected by by pseudonymity. But when you denonymize a single point, then you have a very strong insight in what happened before and what will happen after. So uh, doing this kind of data collection on top of a financial system interacting with the Bitcoin blockchain is uh, incredibly responsible and dangerous. And if you, I mean, if you, uh, if you put all your personal data in, uh, in a social network platform, that could be bad, okay. If you do that in your bank, that's more dangerous. But if you, uh, if you buy a Bitcoin certificate in your, in your bank, your bank knows that you buy Bitcoin certificates, but at least they don't know what happened before to your Bitcoin world and what will happen after from the your Bitcoin world. So buying Bitcoin from a KYC exchange and withdrawing and then just using it for spending is completely irresponsible. It is irresponsible. Uh, um, the, the things that exchanges are doing, they should they should fight KYC. They don't because they, they make money, so they are just adapting. Also. Uh, they are the problem is that exchanges are desperate for uh, recognition by governments because they are scared that uh, in the struggle with Bitcoin that they know that Bitcoin will be in struggle with the government, so they are scared to be shut down. And since they don't want to be shut down, they want to be even more uh, statist than the state. And they are like, uh, please overregulate us. I mean, we will do everything you ask and more. Some of the of the data collection the exchanges are doing are not even required by the government. They are just doing that in addition because they are desperate to seem legit and and and, and reassuring and stuff like that. So uh, right now the situation is super dangerous, and if you are a user of a KYC exchange, uh, I think that you are really risking uh, your personal security. You can have a crazy stalker ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend. You can have a, a mafia uh, local extortioner. You can have you can have a, a, a foreign government or a local government maybe your your government is fine it's not aggressive but you also uh, pay your uh, money to this wikileaks uh, 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 initiative and so the, the other government of another country which is more aggressive will come after you when you pass the border maybe you will feel fine but then you go to the us for the vacation and they will stop you three days in the airport uh, with online security because you donated to wikileaks so Moving Bitcoin from a KYC exchange on chain without coin joining is actually a very dangerous practice. And when you point this out, you get people like uh, uh, most notably recently Trace Mayer and and the the head the head Bitcoin uh, Twitter handle. These people, which are absurdly arguing that if you do if you do this kind of uh, best uh, privacy practices. Yeah, then you connect you actually, North Korea to a terrorist. I mean, it's totally ridiculous, right? I mean, and then your risk score in an, in the KYC exchange will rise, and so it's dangerous because maybe uh, you are you will not you will make exchanges unhappy. But the whole point is that I mean, there there are two basic uh, flows in this in this uh, in this view. The first one is that uh, Bitcoin in these very super restricted circumstances. Uh, make in this scenario make any sense at all it doesn't if you have bitcoin but bitcoin is a completely regulated and controlled and censored instrument then you don't need bitcoin in the first place if you have a bitcoin that can be completely controlled kyc then just use a centralized uh, state-run counterparty it's just the same and of course somebody can say oh but bitcoin has supply a limited supply why fiat money is bad because it's a limited supply 
But I, uh, come on, fiat money before had the limited supply as well because it was gold standard. And then the government just decided that they were just taking all that gold uh, with, the, with, the, with the Confiscation Act and uh, everybody was registered and so everybody was confiscated. So if everything is controlled and censored, uh, even the, 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 the kept supply, even the limited supply uh, is not a reliable uh, feature anymore. It, it's, it's only as reliable as long uh, the government wants it to be reliable. When they want to change it, they will change it because they will just make it legal to go through some, they will make it mandatory to use an inflationary Bitcoin and they will just blacklist non-inflationary Bitcoins. So what's, what's even the point of thinking that you can have a regulated compliant Bitcoin? Bitcoin is black market money. Bitcoin is defiance. Of course, you can want to invest on the Bitcoin experiment without yourself needing any kind of censorship resistance. So maybe you are a Swiss investor, a traditional Swiss or a UK, London city investor, and you want to speculate on the uh, asset Bitcoin because you understand the black market money can be interesting on a global scale on the long run because it is government resistant, is politically neutral. So because Bitcoin is impossible to regulate, then you who are a regulated person who don't care about the censorship resistant at the personal level will invest on that. So you go to your bank and you buy an ETF or you buy a certificate, you buy ATN, basically you buy, you buy Bitcoin flavored risk. But you don't need Binance or, or, or anything else. You don't need Coinbase for, for you just use your London bank. I will ask your London bank to buy uh, shares in a company holding Bitcoin. There, there are a lot of those. So if you want Bitcoin as a speculation without the defiance of the, of the global surveillance, uh, just use Bitcoin uh, synthetic certificates. If you do want Bitcoin, uh, KYC is not only stupid, but it's also very, very dangerous. And you should coin join and open lighting channels. And you should always do like UTXO selection and, uh, and you, you shouldn't uh, yeah. uh, aggregate still, UTXO. Yeah. But Giacomo, it's, it's still really uh, way too complex. And it was sorry for me, to be honest with you, I did tell that I'm, 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 I'm just using Samurai in the Whirlpool and I'm hoping that the mobile, uh, you know, mixing by default is going to come. It's going to make a lot of things easier for, for, for average noobs out there. So I'm hoping for that and, you know, for more decentralized structures to buy non-KYC Bitcoin, just for a conclusion. Let me, um, I want to, you know, continue with these aspects a little bit, go deeper maybe next time. I, I'd love to, because uh, Eric Basco really would love to do that. He's right now also traveling, so I thought uh, would be a, would have been a good chance. But maybe we can continue this next time. Uh, just for the fun part, <laughs> Giacomo. So our my followers and listeners. So Victor Aram asked um, uh, Bitcoin. You know, does it have the potential to reach ten million per coin uh, in to, in the somewhere in the twenty twenties in dollars terms? Do you want to comment on that? In, in today dollars terms, it's uh, it's kind of uh, I mean it's, it's not difficult, right? You take the the supply, uh, even if you if you go very large with the supply, like twenty one million for sake of simplicity, and you take the demand that, that is needed for that. It's not impossible. I think it's a little bit unrealistic uh, because I mean that will basically take more than you will have to take over most of the black market worldwide, most of the gold market, and some of the financial derivatives. So. I guess it's a little bit aggressive as an estimation. Uh, it's not completely impossible, let's say. Okay, cool. Um, do you have an opinion uh, about the stock to flow model by Plan B? So uh, it's it's very challenging for me. I think that it's evidently fitting very well ex post the the, the 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 past dynamics. So that's that's clear. I mean, uh, the, the point is that uh, any kind of model in a in a market is a little bit. Uh, you have a non-linearity, right? If, if a model becomes established, then people will start to trade based on the model. And so for a, for a while, it will just self-fulfill. And then it will just self-defeat because people will try to, to front-run the model. So you cannot, by definition, have a consistent, secure model, uh, in, at least in the, micro, in the micro state of the market. Overall, as a, as a heuristic for the super long-term uh, average dynamic of the market. I think it's a very good, uh, it's a very good uh, logical model. 
uh, it makes sense, at least in some specific circumstances, and it's, it has been proved to be kind of fitting. Of course, you, you cannot trade based on solely on that, because the point of trading is that if, if everybody knows a model, people will try to front run the model and we just invalidate the model. I'm all, totally with you, Dan. Uh, what do you think about the books, The Sovereign Individual? I mean, I've read it partially, but do you know the book? The I know the book. I, yeah, yeah, I read it and loved it before Bitcoin, actually. Uh, <laughs> before I discovered Bitcoin in, 2000, in uh, late 2012, beginning of 2013, uh, I was actually starting to go, I mean, uh, the, the year before I started to read about Bitcoin, I was in Panama helping rich Italian investors to get a Panamanian residency in order to, uh, to have a double residency. So, uh, um, so the, the sovereign individual was all about uh, geographical arbitrage. Uh, so it, it was, uh, the, the, the main thesis of the book is technology changes political power. And the new technologies of information are changing the, 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 the balance of power in a way that the government that was uh, uh, all powerful and impossible to uh, to, uh, to, to overcome is now actually almost getting weaker than the rich, uh, well-connected and well-organized individual. The individual can actually go around shopping um, government. Uh, but, uh, so I, I really agree that technology is doing that. The, the word after Bitcoin, I think is a little bit different from the word in the sovereign individual. In, there are a few pages of the sovereign individual book that are actually, are actually uh, predicting Bitcoin in a way. Like the, the author is really talking about uh, this kind of digital cash that will also make uh, 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 state-run currencies obsolete. But I think what he didn't really predict is that in a world where you can uh, really converge online with the same degree of privacy and censorship resistance that you have offline with cash, then maybe you don't even need so much is uh, so much uh, geographical arbitrage. What I mean is, uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, re obsessed about where I will live, with what passport, with where I will put my company, where I will put my bank account, when and if I will have money. Unfortunately, back then I didn't have money, so it was just a theoretical exercise. But uh, now, I'm, I still think about those things, but not as much, uh, as the, uh, not as much anymore, because I mean, I don't have Bitcoin, of course, but if I, if I had any Bitcoin, uh, where are they? Everywhere, nowhere. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. ge geography is not as much as important right. as in that book, but it's still a good level of protection. Right. Okay. Um, how is the layer three development going? That's another question from somebody else. Yeah, so there, there, would, there would be a lot to say about this, but let's, let's, oh, yeah, cut, it let's, let's sure. cut it out. Okay. It, it, it's, it's going well. It's going well. And I, I suggest you to follow the uh, LNPBP organization on GitHub, mm -hmm. where uh, some people starting from the work on RGP, which is basically an asset level, layer on top of Lightning Network. So it's a sort of layer three technology. And then there, there are just already some ideas about some layer three technology, like message passing on top of Lightning and so on. And so there is, there is a lot of stuff going on there. And right. uh, it's, it's very interesting. I think that uh, uh, um, uh, just as Bitcoin is so deep as a layer that you should not mess with it and you should always be uh, slow and safe and uh, backward compatible and, uh, and um, adversarial and, uh, and resisting to external influences. And uh, as the same, as the same, uh, in the same way, the upper layers like uh, layer three technologies you can really be experimental and mm -hmm. you can be more reckless and you can try out science. I mean, most of the things that they, they, uh, most of the things that people were experimenting with cryptocurrencies were are realistic, but not completely uninteresting ideas. The problem was the layer. You cannot start your own money for every kind of silly application you think of, but you can try to put any kind of silly application in a upper layer on top of the existing infrastructure. You will probably fail, but but that's a better layer to fail and to experiment. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so there's, uh, and the funniest question, uh, there's not gonna be a, uh, is there gonna be a Zux IPO? Zuxi, Zux, <laughs> Zuxi maximalism. <laughs> no, let's no, yeah, let's yeah, put that aside. Uh, unconfiscatable uh, event is gonna be taking place, right? In, in, in Las Vegas, when is it gonna be? When? So it, it's, uh, it should be like uh, uh, 22, 23, the conference. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me check again. Let me check on the website, unconfiscatable 
www.ecomsystems.com. Uh, so I can tell you the date. Also because uh, uh, there is, a, I'm also running a workshop yeah. uh, before that. Exactly. So yes, yeah. the, the conference, the conference itself is uh, uh, is uh, on the twentieth. Uh, oh, sorry, no, no. So uh, okay, conference overall is twenty to twenty three of February. Right. So it's three days. Right. And when you do a special um, workshop for people who yeah. want, really want to go deep into like how to set up a full node and I mean everything from A to Z, right? So yeah, that's 2021. The workshop okay. is called Running Bitcoin. And the idea is to get people that doesn't even know how to do common line. And the goal is in two days to have them coming in with a laptop without anything on top of it. Then we will give them a Raspberry Pi and two hardware wallets and some connectors and adapters. And the idea is that they will learn what they are doing step by step. So they will not do a lot. They will install yeah. Bitcoin Core, validating Lightning Network. Maybe I will try to do joint market, even if it's a little bit challenging, but we will try. And an Electrum setup for multi-sig. Uh, what you will come up with will be an experience to, in order to allow you to get into more depth in, of that. Yeah. So I really, I mean, uh, it's, it's a paid workshop. So uh, I want to say this very clearly. We are asking for the first people registering, uh, uh, basically, uh, what is it? I don't even remember, probably $1,000 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, it's a lot, uh, but I think that that's, uh, that's I mean, we, yeah. we have, for, we have, and for every noob, right? I mean, it's also for Bitcoin beginner. It doesn't have to be like an intermediate or advanced or, I mean, it's really yeah, yeah, for no, any this is, this, okay. Yeah, this is, this gotcha. is considered from scratch. And, right. uh, and the idea is that people that are already passionate about Bitcoin as a concept, maybe they are traders, maybe they are political activists, maybe they are, they are uh, financial guys. So they, are, they already understand why Bitcoin, but they don't really know how to start about how to Bitcoin. So that's right. the, the goal of the, of the workshop. Right. So anyway, um, Giacomo, thank you so much. Giacomo Zucco, thank you so much for, uh, you know, taking your time. I'm hoping really uh, looking forward for maybe another panel talk with Eric Brasco next time, if sure, it's in any sure. way, sh uh, shape or form possible. And yeah, I hope to see you soon, maybe, you know, face to face sometime soon at some event, uh, you know, whether here in Europe or any other continent. And yeah, have a good weekend. All right. Same. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you, Giacomo. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Hey, so thank you so much for listening and for your questions again uh, to my listeners, followers, uh, my Twitter, you know, my, my subscribers. Thanks again. I uh, hope you loved it as much as, as I did. My really awesome, fascinating talk with Giacomo Zucco. Uh, I totally agree with um, Giacomo that it takes, yes, it takes uh, suffering. It takes pain. Uh, for people to learn, to understand, to be willing, to be open, you know, to have the pain point. It, it really is. But, you know, I know I'm convinced and I trust, uh, you know, in the power of dynamic uh, exponential by order of magnitude um, uh, comprehension process, evolutionary process, would it be, you know, on an educational level on scientific technological development, uh, um, uh, you know, process. So there is a process and, and, I know I trust there, we have the capabilities, we have the power, we have the knowledge, we have the in, uh, you know, intelligence together as totality. So uh, th this is the question I'm asking, you know, if things go much, much faster uh, uh, than expected, you know, the crisis, the crash, uh, you know, the inflation, hyperinflation, maybe even a war or whatever that is, you know, um, in the Middle East, I'm, I'm hoping not, but I know I trust that we can facilitate, we can, uh, you know, really facilitate the process of uh, of satisfying, um, of fulfilling the needs of, you know, the average uh, Joe and Mary out there on the street. You know, we can make it more easy. Of course, yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm totally up for, you know, self-responsibility, empowerment, uh, you know, giving back the responsibility to the individual. But I know together, you know, with all the, uh, you know, technologies, programmers, developers, coders, educators, podcasters, um, uh, yeah, even the mainstream institutions, the financial institutions, everybody that is, you know, on board uh, with an with an ethical uh, and 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 really human ethical state of mind and a position and 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 
you know, and, 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 and the vision that we can all have for, for a better world, for, you know, for, for humanity's, uh, you know, potential for, for better, you know, um, unimaginable uh, evolutionary human civilization on, on every level that I've already, you know, repeated so many times, not only a monetary, economical, financial level, but especially on a structural, social, uh, scientific, te technological, and even spiritual level. And it, you know, this is not about esoterics. This is really about how can we evolve? You know, we're not alone, uh, not in this universe, not in any other universes. So, um, so we, I know, you know, things are coming up and, and, and I guess, you know, the, the desire for, for having, uh, you know, a painless life uh, to, 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 to bring yourself into this civilization um, with your best potential, with your best version, you know, with, uh, with every, you know, potential and capabilities and potentials we have, each and every one of us, I know we can achieve this much faster. I know this and, and with, with, you know, with a smoother transition. Uh, so this is, you know, I get, I, I guess you get my message. So uh, spread the message. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, get back to me. If you are an ethical Bitcoin sponsor, get back to me. I'm really looking for one or two ethical Bitcoin sponsors so I can go, you know, to the conferences and do highest quality recordings, audio and or uh, video pod, uh, uh, podcasts and, and, and interviews and, and reports especially on investigative level. Uh, so yeah, I really want to educate more. Um, and thank you so much again for your support for, and, and give me a follow, uh, subs uh, subscribe to my, uh, you know, different podcast platforms on YouTube. Uh, give me a follow on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, or wherever you are, whatever you, whatever social media you're using. And yeah, um, I'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.